First of all, I, I'd like to say I'm, like, I'm kind of blown away, Daniel, that we've got so many people at 4.30 in the afternoon who've come to a talk on data modeling. I, I know. It's, it's really telling. Uh, yeah, welcome to the Daniel and Dan show. Yeah, and, um. and again, thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, we'll try and make data modeling as interesting as it can be. Uh, so I'm Dan McClary. I'm part of the BigQuery team at Google. And I'm joined by Daniel Mintz from Looker. He's the chief data evangelist. Um, and like we said, we're going to talk about data modeling. And we're going to try and make it as exciting as possible. Now, the title of the slide is a little bit misleading because we're not going to talk about data modeling just for BigQuery. Um, we're actually going to talk about data modeling, to some extent, its history, what's changed, how we should challenge our assumptions, and similarly, not just how is data modeling maybe changed for massive analytical systems, but also for business intelligence and reporting. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how BigQuery is different from the systems for which some of our original assumptions around data modeling originated, and then similarly about how modern BI tools can take advantage of some of these differences. So hopefully that's interesting to you guys, and we'll try and keep it light, and we'll try and take some questions and talk through some common cases as well. So, for me, as I was thinking about how we were going to put this talk together, the, the thing I, I sort of asked myself is, well, where did we learn to model data? You know, and some people didn't learn to model data. They just have an ORM or something modeled data for them, or they inherited it, and that's sometimes tough. But where did we learn to model data? And I think for most of us, the answer is actually quite simple. COD. Oh, no, not, not, not that COD. This COD. Um, this, is, this is Edgar Codd. If you guys haven't seen Edgar Codd before, he, uh, he is due a great debt in the, uh, in the data and analytics space. Um, so Edgar Codd is the man who created the relational data model. And, and he started this with a paper he wrote in 1970 called A Relational Model for Data in Large Shared Data Banks. Quick history note, back in the 70s, we didn't have databases, we had data banks. Same thing. But that's what they were called. Um, now, in this paper, Codd outlines the foundation of a relational model, right? So he defines a system of tuples, and importantly, an algebra on those tuples. And this is the thing that leads us to languages like SQL, where we can have declarative languages that are very easily able to produce execution plans that we can use to analyze data. And this gets us a long, long way, right? Like this gets us from the very early databases of the 70s to all of the things we can do with big data processing and systems like BigQuery today. Now, in that, Cod had two really primary concerns, um, data independence and data inconsistency. So in his mind, these were, these were the things that had to be addressed, right? And part of the value of the relational model is that you get data independence, right? Your data looks a little bit like relationships in the real world, and it's easy to add fields, it's easy to do stuff with it. But it also helps guard against data inconsistency, right? And data inconsistency can lead to wrong results and you know, miscomputed bills and all kinds of pain. And if you guys are familiar with COD, you may have heard of these things in your university class, normal forms, right? And this starts with the first normal form, which is introduced in the paper in 1970. And with the help of others, evolved all the way up through the fifth normal form. Um, now, many of us who work in the database industry may remember taking schemas and saying, oh, I've got to get to 3NF, or 4NF, or BCNF, which is voice COD normal form, or even to 5NF in the most, most extreme situations. Um, now, there are lots of good reasons for normalization, right? So increasing data independence is actually great, right? Because it makes it easy for us to extend our models of what the world looks like, right? Our data can well represent what happens in the world. And again, reducing data inconsistency is great because anomalies are confusing and problematic. So what do we mean when we say easy to extend, right? Add new types, mirror the real world. I've said that a few times now. Um, avoiding anomalies can be different things, right? One of the things that Cod was really, really concerned about was avoiding duplicates and conflicting values. Conflicting values in particular can, can remain a challenge. But the other thing that Cod was dealing with were operational constraints, right? I mean, Cod was a man of his time. He was a man at the cutting edge of technology, and he was making sure that the system he was describing fit well with the operational constraints of the day. And, and this was the constraint of the day. Um, you may have never seen a picture of this before. This is the IBM System 360. This was the premier database platform from 1964 to 1978. And it ran a hierarchical database called IMS. IMS was, well, IMS is now 51 years old, um, and I think still runs in production in many places. But so Cod's primary argument was hierarchical databases like IMF, uh, IMS, sorry, um, 
can have these problems of consistency, have these problems of data duplication, they can be really difficult to make model lots of general purpose situations. And so his relational model made it much simpler for us to capture and represent information in a queryable fashion that could answer a broad set of constraints. So things, though, have changed, right? Most of us don't come to work every day in sort of a burnt umber kind of room with spinning tapes and looking very fashionable. Um, sometimes I wish I did. But, uh, but things have changed. And because things have changed, it's worthwhile when we think about modeling data to say, yes, the things that Cod was after were important, and they, and they matter to how we represent our data and how we analyze it. But some things have probably changed with respect to our operational constraints. And, and as such, we should think about maybe we could do things differently. So again, I don't, I don't want to make anyone think that normalization is not important, right? Normalized data models are really important. They still matter, right? Data's moving fast. It's changing all the time. And so this notion of data independence is huge, right? It still matters quite a lot. And nobody wants wrong results, right? Wrong results are just unacceptable. Um, now, access and simplicity of queries, though, I think matter far more than they ever did. And part of the reason about, of this is that more and more people are analyzing data. More and more people are analyzing lots of data. Right? And so making it simple for other people to write queries against data or to build reports against data is really, really important as well. So the question I, I keep coming back to is, like, how do we challenge these sort of normal assumptions in modern environments? Right? What are the things that are different? Um, one of the things I think is really hugely different in modern distributed data processing systems is that duplicate records don't cost money like they used to. Right? If we go back to our picture of the IBM 360, that data was stored on tapes or on giant, giant magnetic hard drives. Right? The cost of a, a megabyte of storage in, in the 60s and 70s was tremendous. Right? And so the graph we have here is basically average cost of a gigabyte in a year starting from 1980. It didn't go all the way back to the 70s. And if we see in this is it's basically dropped to zero, right? So when we think about normalization, when we think about our data modeling, one of the real specters of, of denormalization kind of goes away, right? Because the, the price just drops out. Having a duplicate record is fine. Um, now, if a duplicate record causes an inconsistency, that's an issue. So this allows us to kind of relax some of the constraints that we might have heard of when we were going through our university courses, right? So, so the old ru CODs rule, you know, the key and nothing but the key, so help me COD, right? We can, we can reduce that a little bit. Um, the notion of these like, things like non-prime attributes, right? We can have more stuff in tables than we used to because it doesn't cost us a fortune to store data or to store small amounts of data. Um, we also have the ability now to think about complex types stored inside rows in a way that we couldn't. And this is a thing that BigQuery is actually quite good at and, and somewhat natively designed for. The other thing is that distributed systems are the new normal, right? When, when Cod was writing his paper in 1970, networks weren't a thing, right? They weren't a thing that query processors had access to. Nowadays, when we look at big data systems like Hadoop, Spark, things like that, and systems like BigQuery, distributed systems are the way we process massive amounts of data. Now, that means that there are new costs to consider. Now, just a, just a quick show of hands. How many of you know what a shuffle operation is? All right, so a few people know what a shuffle operation is. A few people don't. Just to make sure people understand, if I have a multi-stage distributed process and I have to pass data from one set of workers to another, that effectively amounts to shuffling data around. Now, this is costly because I have to take those bytes. I've got to serialize them. I've got to put them on a protocol stack. I've got to send them down to the NIC, across the wire, and bring it all the way back up again. And that's a cost we didn't used to have in single monolithic systems. So this means when we do things like joining data, there's a cost because there's transport that's happening. right? And so while joins are incredibly useful and they're a key part of the way anyone analyzes data, we do have to ask ourselves, is a join really improving my workload? Or is this join just something I'm, I, I've, in, I've incurred because I've blindly normalized data according to rules from the past? So the other thing is that columnar access has become a big deal for analytical processing. Right? So back in the 70s and then onward, right, when we talk about OLTP systems, these are usually row-oriented. Right? And this means that when we access data, we're accessing it a row at a time. And this is one of the reasons that Cod had this notion of like, well, look at it, nothing but the key and facts related to that key. Because when you go and fetch that data, you're fetching the whole row. 
Columnar storage, such as what BigQuery uses, allows us to say, I'm interested in column one. Just go get column one. And we don't pay a cost for accessing null values. We don't pay a cost for storing null values. And we don't pay a cost for accessing the other columns because we don't have to, right? We only access the column itself. And this kind of raises the question in my mind of, well, we can relax COD's rules around keys a little bit because in a columnar system, many fields can be key-like. So I think this, for me, sets up some priorities for data models in modern data warehouses. When I think about systems like BigQuery and, and other cloud data warehouses, I think we need to reevaluate what our priorities are. And I think one of the biggest ones is you make your queries easy to write because you want more and more people to analyze data. You want to be able to get more out of the system. So make your queries easy to write. Right? If you can denormalize in a way that helps you get to an easy query, go for it. Make that data easy to join, right? So don't have things that require you have joining the data six ways. Maybe just the most important joins, the most obvious joins, are things that users can get a lot of benefit out of. Now, if you can aid performance by utilizing things like complex types, using things like nesting, which I think Daniel's going to talk about a bit, this is great, right? This is we want to get performance out of our queries. But the first, the first order of business is to make sure people can use the data. All right, and then make data easy to update if it's required. Right? So don't go overboard on the performance or on the denormalization if it means that your updates process is going to be tremendously complicated. Right? And then finally, I think parsimony is a huge piece of this. And when I think about the spirit of what Cod was writing about in the 70s, I think that's actually a huge piece of this. Right? The relational model, in some senses, is all about parsimony. It's about making the data model something you can look at and say, like, yes, that's like the real world. And we have the opportunity with modern systems to reflect that even more, even more closely, I think. So Daniel, do you want to tell us a little bit about what was going on in business intelligence as it evolved and what's different now? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm going to come at this from the entirely different angle, right? So Dan started at the bottom of the stack um, with COD and, and the databases, the IBM System 360, um, and the tapes that drove it. Uh, and I'm going to come from the top of the stack. Uh, from people who are working in business and trying to understand what the data means, what it means to their business, how do they make better decisions with that data. Um, so, you know, when we talk about business intelligence, this is a thing that's been around at least since the early 80s. Um, and the systems that people used for business intelligence back in the early 80s uh, were monolithic systems. And they were monolithic systems where you bought uh, the BI system that sat on top of the database, uh, the data warehouse, and you bought all those things together, right? You had you know, systems like Cognos and business objects, uh, MicroStrategy, Informatica. Lots of those are actually still around today. Lots of you know, Fortune 500 companies, if you go into them, you're going to see these systems still in place. Um, and they sat on top of the very first you know, columnar stores like Ter Teradata and, and Oracle. And the reason that you had to buy a monolithic stack was pretty simple. It was because that was the only thing there was, right? Systems, because they were slow and because they were expensive, the only way that you could query data to get information about your business was with these monolithic stacks. You bought all in one, right? And so, you know, why? Well, you had slow, expensive hardware. That was the defining constraint. Uh, for, for that decided what you were going to buy and how it was built. Um, you know, IT, which is a word that has come to mean, I think, a different thing among uh, the newer breed of companies. It's like IT is the people you go to to fix your, your laptop now. But IT used to be the, the department that owned all technology in the company, right? And when you were talking about these monolithic stacks, IT was the, was the department that owned that stack. Right? And they owned that stack. They probably owned the server farm uh, where you, you know, the semi backed up with your new you know, Hyperion uh, data warehouse and, and trucked it into the, the data um, warehouse that was actually a physical warehouse. Right? Um, and you know, so, so that was another big constraint was that IT had to own it because they were the only people with the technological know-how um, to make it work. And you know, the other constraint was we didn't have data flowing in from every device in our pocket and every server uh, in our server, uh, you know, in, in the cloud. And just there's so much data now, but that was not true back then because data entry was actual data entry. There were data entry clerks who sat and entered data, right? If you were managing 
hundreds or thousands of stores. There wasn't you know, a point of sale system that automatically sent data about what had been bought back to the mothership. Someone sat down every day or every week uh, or every month and typed that in, right? So you just didn't have that much data that you were dealing with. And so, you know, these systems grew up, these first wave systems grew up, and they did have some advantages, right? First of all, because IT owned them, the answers that you got out of them were reliable. There was a single you know, department, a single person in a lot of cases who owned the system, and they said, yes, I stamped this with my stamp of approval, and I say this data is right. And so if you were trying to produce an SEC report, uh, you knew that the data in it was right because somebody who really knew the data had blessed it. You know, they also made it really easy to make pixel perfect stuff because you were still printing these reports out uh, in a lot of cases. You didn't have, you know, touch screens that you could interact with them on. You, they had to be pixel perfect because you were printing them. And for 1980s, 1990s, they were pretty fast, right? You could actually get access to the data in, in a reasonable amount of time, you know, days, not weeks or months, uh, and you could get your reports that you needed to run your business. Um, but there were some disadvantages, not surprisingly. First of all, they were terribly inflexible, right? You'd put in a request for a new report or a new dashboard, and first of all, you only had the authority to put in that request if you were probably a C-level exec, and you only could do that uh, if you were in a giant company that could actually afford one of these systems. Um, and so you'd, you'd put in that request, and you'd wait you know, two or three months to get your new dashboard. They were locked down, right? People couldn't access the data because, my god, if you access the data, it would overload the, the data warehouse, and that would be crazy because we don't want to have to spend another million dollars to buy another appliance uh, to run more queries. Um, and they were pretty low resolution. Luckily, there wasn't that much data, so low data resolution wasn't that big a deal, but they were. And so as the scales of data grew over time, people were not seeing the raw data, but they were seeing roll-ups and summaries, right? Because the only way to make these systems continue to work on larger sets of data was to reduce the size of that data by summarizing it uh, and accessing those in the dashboards. So, you know, not surprisingly, people started to get fed up with these first wave tools uh, because they weren't living up to, to their, their evolving needs. And so, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you start to see the second wave of BI tools, and these are all about self service. You don't have to wait for IT anymore. You can self-serve to the data. And you get this proliferation, this explosion of different tools, right? Visualization tools, and you have a governance tool over here, and your ETL tool is over here, and you, know, you still got your data engine up here, and you still have your legacy system, which still runs your SEC reports, because those have to be perfect. And when we close quarter, we use that. But if we're doing right, and so you just have all of these different tools. And you know, again, why? Well, first of all, computers had gotten a lot faster, right? The, you, know, you now have PCs uh, and even laptops that can hold a reasonable amount of data. Not nearly as much data as lives in your warehouse, but you could maybe carve off a chunk of data that you really cared about because you were in finance, and you could carve off some of that finance data. You'd get a hold of it. You wouldn't give it back. Uh, and you'd load it you know, into a server under your desk or, or onto your laptop. So you could do some analysis. Um, and your computer was fast enough to actually slice and dice that data in, in some reasonable ways so you could get some meaning out of it. Um, people uh, went to the second wave because they were fed up with the IT bottleneck. Right? They were sick of waiting three months for a change to their dashboard. I want to change the title on my dashboard. Great, get in line. We'll be with you in three months. That didn't fly anymore. And because the amount of data that people were trying to work with was growing and they were sick of uh, of you know, having to do roll-ups, they said, well, but I only care about this little slice of data, and I can fit that on my computer, so I want high-resolution access to just that data. And so they could do that with these new tools. So you know, in terms of advantages, this gave people a lot more agility than they'd ever had before, and that was a big win. Right? They could actually self-serve to the data, and that gave them much faster time to insight. It meant that they weren't waiting months and months to get any explanation, any uh, response. And it also gave them that higher data resolution. But it had some, some disadvantages, right? You know, I think the tools of this era, partially by necessity, necessitated by the technology of the day, um, they made some choices about things that they would hold on to and keep and things that they would throw away. And one of the things that they threw away was a shared model, a shared understanding at the business level about what the data actually meant. Right? That thing had used, it used to live in the first wave tools in the monolithic stack and in the way that the data was rolled up. 
you get these you know, second wave tools, people are slicing off a little bit of the data, into, you know, analyzing it in a workbook. Now all of a sudden the meaning of the data, that shared understanding of what the data means, that gets left behind. You're also really dependent on data extracts, and data extracts are really troubling because I extracted my data last month and you extracted your data last week, and now they're not in sync and we don't know why, and so rather than spending the meeting discussing what our strategy going forward should be, we spend the whole meeting trying to debug why we're getting different results out of our data, right? And then, you know, the third disadvantage was just that you had this tool explosion. You had so many tools uh, that people just had trouble keeping track of what's, what, what, how am I supposed to get this data from here to there, right? Um, and so that, that created a lot of problems. So that's kind of, that's from the, the BI perspective, what was happening at the same time that, you know, COD and, uh, and the data warehouses that, or the databases that turned into columnar data warehouses were, were growing underneath. So let's... Let's jump forward to today. So we, we can actually talk about the fact that maybe things are different now. Maybe, yeah. maybe we can do some new things. I think it is, it's interesting to point out and worthwhile that the consumerization of data that business, business intelligence and reporting enabled actually really challenges the fact that we need good models, right? We need a good data model, largely relational, but we may have to think about ways to make it easier for consumers to get at it in ways that allow them to have shared understanding, like real shared understanding, both at the warehousing level and at the tool level. So, you know, it's a talk about BigQuery and other things, and so it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about BigQuery. Um, in part because we think of it as a really good example for, for a modern data warehouse that's cloud native that requires us to challenge our modeling assumptions. Now, for those of you who don't know about BigQuery, don't know what it is, right? BigQuery is Google's enterprise data warehouse. It's the, it's the warehouse we built starting with the, the Dremel project, which we wrote a paper about about 10 years ago. Um, it's central to the way Google analyzes data. And in BigQuery, we make it available to GCP customers. And the thing about it that's really different is unlike systems in which maybe I was designing for a fashionable 1970s uh, IMS system, or even the, the warehousing appliances of the 80s and 90s, you know, Dremel and BigQuery were really designed to be query engines that operated at data center scale. And this means that we can take advantage of things that are, that are somewhat unique to GCP and unique to Google, right? We separate specifically storage and compute. Now, in many big data systems, this would th seem like anathema, like this would be a real problem because I want to keep close to the data. However, because Google's networks are so fast, and I encourage everybody to take a look out on the show floor at the Jupyter switch that we've brought, because this is really some of the stuff that makes GCP super powerful, we have a petabit bisection in our network, which means all of a sudden I can have vast amounts of compute that are separate from storage, but access that data as if it were effectively local. Now this means that our query engine can do a lot of stuff at scale that's really, really different. It also means I can start to play some really interesting games with the way I model my data. Now, the compute engine itself is, is based on, is Dremel. It is our Dremel architecture. And this is effectively a dynamic serving tree of many, many shards of compute workers that can apply thousands of cores to problems, right? This is a dyna dynamically organized tree, and we are able to size the resources per the query. Now, the nice thing is that there's an economic advantage in so much as you only pay for the CPU cycles that you're using. But at the same time, it also means we can apply a tremendous amount of compute to some of these, to some of these problems. Right? It allows us to have multi-stage queries that go really fast. So joining's OK, joining's safe. But at the same time, it's a distributed system. And so we need to make sure that joins are things that we want to do, right? that they really make sense in the, in the context of the problem. Now, the other thing, I talked about shuffle and the cost of shuffle. Well, shuffle in any distributed system costs. However, BigQuery does a unique thing when it shuffles, right? It shuffles to remote memory. We wrote a really interesting blog about this earlier in the year. And by having a remote shuffle layer, this allows us to handle shuffle operations much faster and at a higher scale than most systems. So this means that you know, we can join data even in situations in which denormalization might help us. Um, but it does mean that because there's a shuffle stage, things like key skew can cause problems. And so this is just an example of how something like a select buy with a where clause and a group would actually move in and out of remote shuffle, right? And the pipelining that you get from a remote memory shuffle is such that, again, you can do really interesting joins, but it also means that there is a tax when you do a join. 
Now, our managed storage, as I mentioned earlier, is columnar, right? And we take care of things like durability by default. So when you put data into BigQuery, not only is it translated into our, our proprietary columnar storage format, Capacitor, which there's another great blog on, um, we store columns in their own files, we compress these and encrypt them on disk. So the data is always encrypted. And then we replicate it across data centers. You have, your, your data is available in multiple zones and resilient to failure. Now, this, this columnar storage allows us to do some really interesting stuff because not only is it columnar and allows us to have many key-like attributes, it also allows us to take advantage of the fact that we can filter on these things when, we comp when they're still compressed. So the notion is, I don't have to go and pay the CPU cost to decompress things just to figure out how the where clause applies. I can apply it to the data before I've decompressed it. Now, all of this means, I think, a few things, right? Again, we can think about having many key-like attributes. Right? We can think about having complex fields and types because a columnar, storage, a columnar storage engine or a columnar storage system that supports complex types allows us to model data in a different fashion. Um, but it also allows us to say, you know what? Normalization matters to me, right? I have a relational model that represents my business, that represents my world, and I need to run joins. That's okay, right? We can bring that and I can move whole hog into, into BigQuery and have exactly the, the same kind of querying experience I would expect. So, Daniel, what, what was happening in BI? What sort of new tools have emerged in this space to kind of deal with the cloud, the, the cloud experience, if yeah. you will? Yeah, so, you know, the we talked about the first two waves. Um, so let's let's start from the sort of middle layer, right? So we talked we've talked about the bottom layer, the actual hardware that's driving these, the top layer, the business side. But you know, in the middle, you've got these this way of accessing the data in its sort of raw form, right? And so um, I'm sure this won't come to news as most to most of you, but um, you know, programming language development looked uh, a little bit something like this, right? You start with machine code. People realize that writing ones and zeros is kind of tedious, and so they're like, all right, let's do assembly. You get Fortran and COBOL, uh, basic. Then people, C comes along in the early 70s. This is a huge revolution. 95, it turns out, was a great year for programming languages. PHP, JavaScript, Ruby, and Java all appear in 1995. Um, but you know, you get this, this wide range, and really what's happening here is that the level of abstraction from the actual processor that is doing the work is increasing, right? Go is this amazing uh, language that very sort of uh, pithily lets you run you know, incredibly fast programs on tons of distributed processors, right? Machine code, you can't do that because you wouldn't want to write that in ones and zeros. On the data side, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, so you, you know, we start with data written to files. This is before you have random access memory at all. You roll your own B tree. COD comes along. Then in, you know, in the late 70s, we get SQL, which is really an oper operationalization. Wow, that's hard. Operationalization. I'm curious what the, uh, yeah, the robot got it right. The robot that is transcribing uh, got it right, amazingly. Um, uh, so uh, you get SQL shows up in the late 70s. That's an operationalization of, of COD's rules, right, COD's laws. Um, then you get Oracle and IBM, which turn them into commercial software. Uh, and then in the late 80s, you get T-SQL, which is still SQL. Uh, in the 90s, you get MySQL and Postgres, which are still SQL, fundamentally. Uh, and really, there hasn't been very much development on the data side, right? So at the same time that programming languages have been evolving enormously, data language has been kind of stuck. Um, and so you know, in terms of what we actually want, um, you know, we want to define relationships and definitions once. We don't want to have to do that repeatedly. Computers are good at doing tasks repeatedly. Humans like to do it once and be done with it. We want to retain all of the agility that SQL gives us, which is amazing, right? Um, we want an, an easy way of translating what we actually mean, the business question, the question that we care about, into a data query and sending that off uh, to the, the database or the data warehouse so we can get that data that answers the business question back. We want to stay performant, which is you know, becoming less and less of a problem, but still, when you're querying petabytes of data, still is an issue. Um, and we don't really want to worry about syntax, uh, because you know, the proliferation of SQLs means that you have to keep track of little bits of, oh, this is how this one handles date uh, reformatting. And that's, humans shouldn't have to worry about that, right? Computer programmers figured that out. They said, we don't want to worry about that stuff. I don't need to worry about memory management. 
uh, except in you know 1% of the cases. So I won't use C most of the time. I'll use something that takes care of memory management and garbage collection for me. Analysts are still stuck writing SQL where they're worrying about sy syntax. They're doing a lot of these things, right? And so, you know, lots of analysts I talk to say, but I love SQL. And I love SQL too. I'm like, Dan loves SQL too. Does anybody else love SQL? Yeah, SQL's amazing. I, I'm getting a lot of like, <laughs> which is, yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with SQL too. That, that basically describes it. So SQL is amazing. It's proven, it's, you know, it's powerful, it's versatile, it's everywhere. SQL and C fundamentally run the world, right? Um, but SQL's really easy to screw up. Uh, in my first job where I was writing SQL, in the orders table there was this status field and you had to say orders status equals completed, and if you didn't, you would get all the failed credit card transactions returned as part of your query. And you'd go, my God, we had an amazing day! But you didn't, you just had a lot of failed credit card transactions, right? And, you know, so keeping track of, oh, I have to put the group by there, and I have to, oh, what, what's, you know, what dialect am I in? How does it handle date conversions? That's stuff that programmers have gotten away from and, and analysts are still stuck with. And so, you know, what Looker has done, uh, and I should say I was a Looker customer for far longer than I have worked for Looker, um, and so I sort of stumbled on Looker early on in Looker's history, and they made this promise, and I said, oh my god, this, I want this thing, but it doesn't kind of exist, maybe it won't really live up to it, and it totally has lived up to it, and that's why I sort of jumped over the fence, but Looker started with this kernel of this idea, LookML, which is, SQL evolved, right? It says, let's stop worrying about all that stuff. And so, you know, it makes this data language reusable, which is not a thing that SQL is. I know when I go look at SQL I wrote two weeks ago, I give up immediately and don't try. I'm like, oh, I'll write this from scratch again because I have no idea what I was doing, right? Um, it makes data language collaborative because if I try reading something I wrote two weeks ago, something Dan wrote is probably even worse and harder to understand for me because he has his own style of writing it, right? No offense to the way that Dan writes SQL. Um, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> um, uh, it makes, makes data language flexible. It makes it easy to organize so you don't have under, untitled underscore 43 SQL, untitled underscore 44 SQL, uh, these little recipes on your desktop. I definitely have those. Um, and it gives you version control, which is another thing that programmers a long time ago were like, hey, maybe we should keep track of what we did in the past, so if we need to go back, we can, right? Data people, not so much. And the way that it does this is it says, well, really any query can be decomposed into four things. One is a set of relationships between tables. The second is the fields that you actually want. The third is what filters you want to apply to the data. And the fourth is how you want to sort it. And if you have those four things, you can really compose any query, right? A computer could compile those four things down into SQL and send it off to a database. And so that's, that's what LookML is, and that's what allows you to build a sort of third wave of, of BI, right? Which is a data platform that says, you know what? We'll have the data platform take care of those annoying things that we've always worried about and allow people, whether they speak SQL or not, to come in and write queries without looking at the SQL, without needing to look at the SQL, write queries against the data. And that allows you to, uh, to access the data directly, right? And it's only possible because of this data infrastructure revolution that's happened underneath, right? I think big data is a lot of hype. The big data revolution has been a lot of hype and not that much uh, delivery quite yet. But one thing it absolutely did deliver on is enormously fast databases. Right? You go back even five or ten years um, when sort of Hadoop was going to be the answer. Like, how far we've come from then of like, well, maybe we should shard MySQL a lot. Ooh, that's really ugly. Let's use Hadoop. Oh boy. Uh, I, you know, Hadoop was like kind of going back to the old days where you'd like type in the program at night at 11 p.m. and then you'd come back the next morning and you'd be like, oh man, I had a typo. And you'd have to like rerun it the next night, right? That's like, <laughs> it was very much going backwards. So, so, you know, these incredibly fast databases that mostly live in the cloud have made this revolution possible because all of a sudden you didn't have to do all the preparation, right? You could actually sit a data platform on top of these databases and just access the data leveraging all of their power. Um, and so, you know, in this third wave, well, 
first of all, it was only possible because the databases were that fast. Without these databases, it doesn't work. Um, the other reason, one of the other reasons that people wanted this was because they were just sick of having a million tools, right? If you could centralize all this work in one tool, uh, that would make life a lot easier. And the third, as Dan talked about, right, like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the, the x-axis of those two graphs, of those price drop graphs, one started in 1980, the other only started in 2000. And that's because this idea of moving data, shuffling data across a network simply didn't exist in the old days, right? But now that it does, you can access the data in these incredibly fast databases which live in the cloud and then bring it to your machine, right? And so in terms of advantages, well, the third wave means you're getting reliable answers, and not just reliable answers in the sense that the data is consistent, but reliable answers in the sense that someone who knows what the data is supposed to mean went in and said, this is, what the, this is the definition of our you know, KPI. This is the definition of average contract value, and it's A plus B divided by C. And so when you want to access that, you don't have to remember, oh, wait, was it A plus B minus C or over? That's already, that's in the system. The system worries about that for you. It gives you agility because you're not constrained by the data that lives on your machine. You're accessing the data right where it lives, uh, and so you can access all the data. It lets you pick the tools that are right, right? So you choose what is the right amazing cloud database for you, what is the right ETL tool for you? What is the right visualization tool for you? You're not locked into these monolithic systems. And it gives you full resolution. You're not rolling up the data and summarizing it before you access it. You're, you're, you can always drill down right to the lowest row because you send a you know, billion row or 100 billion row query to, Big, to BigQuery, and BigQuery says, all right, I'll be right with you. There are some disadvantages. First is that it's a major shift in thinking, especially for the people who worked in IT when it was called IT. Um, it's like a big deal. They have to like let go. And that's hard for a lot of businesses because these business processes are deeply embedded in the organizations. And so for organizations to think of how they can use data in these new ways is, is actually pretty hard. Um, you do need a powerful data warehouse. If you've got you know, an IBM System 360, the third wave of BI is not for you. Don't do that. Um, and, and this is something that we've only begun to see, but all of a sudden you have insight. You, coming from everywhere, right? Because the people who are closest to what the data actually means, the business people who understand what it means, are able to explore freely, and so they're finding stuff that they couldn't find before. And so going from information scarcity to insight abundance is actually hard in some cases, right? It's, it's the same thing of going from a bunch of Word docs on your machine, now you're collaborating on stuff with a bunch of people. You need Google Drive because you need a way to keep all that stuff organized. Otherwise, you're stuck, oh, no, you were working on that version. I already made changes to that version. I emailed it. Did you not see the email? Right. You don't want to go down that road. So, um, so that is a new way of thinking. Um, but this is possible. So let's, now that we've, we've bored you all with the like, very high level abstract, you've lived through the data model uh, section, now we're going to get practical. Uh, and talk about what it means to model your data in this brave new world. Wait, wait, I had one, I oh, had one okay. more academic point to make. Oh, oh sorry. Which, which is... I lied. I know, I know, yeah. I just can't give it up. Um, which is, though, when we think about, you know, cons the, the spirit of Cod's original work, right, and the, the notion that a relational algebra is a powerful, a powerful tool to apply to modeling real-world situations. You know, the business user needs it too, but for the business user, semantics and context matter as well. Right? It's, not, it's not simply the set theory or the set theoretic operations I want to perform. It's that these have specific in-context meaning. And so I think a lot of what we see in the interplay between you know, classic data modeling and data modeling as it evolves for the BI user is that context is brought, is brought you know, in, in line with the relational model. And, and doing that, I think, is enormously valuable, and people sometimes miss that because the people who actually, in, the people who are in the store running the POS system, they're the ones who could look at the data and go, something's wrong here. A data analyst back at HQ is going to miss that because they don't have that tactile feel for what the data should be, what it should look like. They're going to miss the insights 
if the data has to be shipped off to HQ, and then an analyst has to like, groom it and put it into the system, if they can actually access the data you know, themselves, they're the ones that are going to come up with those insights. Outliers look different the further away you are. That's from them, right? exactly right, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so now, we can be, now we can be a little bit more practical. And, and unfortunately, I think the, the one thing to sort of tell everybody, right, is that, that you know, there's no one hard and fast rule for like, thou shalt model your data this way. Um, all we can do is talk through some of the things that we see, some of the questions that you know, Daniel and I have been asked, um, and, and what we think of our, our reasonable rules of thumb to apply. Um, right, so, so one of the things I get asked a lot is, you know, I'm really worried about denormalizing my data. Like, I've heard systems like BigQuery really like denormalization. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I have this dimension. Should I put it into multiple facts tables? The answer is, of course, maybe, right? Everybody's least favorite answer, maybe. Um, now, the questions you have to ask yourself are actually about the dimension, right? Is this a static dimension? Is it way smaller than the fact? Is the dimension just the list of the 50 US states? You could probably denormalize that pretty safely. Now, if the dimension is something that changes, right, or is used independent of the facts, right, if I have a dimension table that's quite large and used by many, many different fact tables, the, the challenge of, of denormalizing it, whether in a, as a nested structure or into every table as a flat set of columns, is quite large, right? So it might be better left normalizing, normalized, because that actually models the world better, right? It models the world and you know large scalable joins are entirely possible with systems like BigQuery. So again I think this notion of I have a dimension table and I really I really want to know whether or not I should put it with the fact table, should I denormalize it? Well how is it used, right? How is it updated? Like how big is it, right? These are these are the sort of fundamental questions we have to ask. So uh, another one I get asked a lot and, and I think comes up a lot when people come to BigQuery is they look at, they look at our, our type system and they say, okay, wait a second, you've got, you've got arrays and, and structures, right? You have these nested and repeated fields. What do I do with those again? That's, am I, is everything now an array of structs? What, is, what am I supposed to do there? Um, now, the reality of it is, and I think, Daniel, you've got some thoughts on this that you want to share in a bit is that, that nested and repeated fields are, are hugely powerful ways of preserving the logic or the logical uh, relational view while getting the physical benefit of denormalization, right? So if I have a dimension table that represents between it, it and the fact a many to one, or one to many relationship, I can take that dimension table that is the many and embed it as nested and repeated fields into that table and maintain the logical view of, oh, yes, like this order has a list of items in it. Okay, that's, that's reasonable. Um, but there is a question, right? So if that repeated data needs to be updated frequently, that could be a real problem, right? So to say the shopping basket had these items in it, that's fine because that happened once. To say that I'm going to have a nesting of all of the transactions going on forever becomes a real challenge because now I'm saying, oh, I have an array that I have to go in and modify on every row every day with all of the new data. That's probably not the right thing to go and nest. Um, I mean, or even to to go even simpler than that, like the you know, items are a pro are something that belong to the order, mm -hmm. but orders aren't really something that belong to the user. The user can exist separate from that, yep. and so the idea that, oh, I need to go into the user's table, which then contains the orders, which contains the items every time that this user makes a new order, yeah. That and well, and it, it, creates, it creates a real problem then also in terms of trying to reflect the world, right? Yeah. If we want the people who are writing reports and people who are analyzing data to be able to write queries or build reports that model the world, right, we have to make sure that we're not sort of overly denormalizing for the sake of performance and as such breaking our view of reality. Yeah. Right? It also, like, if you have to, as an analyst, write SQL, you would like it to not be terribly complicated. Like, why do I have to do an unnest on the orders in the user to get to the thing? Yeah. That's, that's not what we want, right? So when do we think about nesting, right? Daniel, you've got more thoughts you're going to share, as, as I said. But again, sometimes it makes sense if we're trying to preserve the logical relationship because it's an important relationship. But we shouldn't just do it because we're blindly seeking performance or because I read the BigQuery docs and it's like, oh, well, they have nested. I better figure out how to use nested. So one of the things I see a lot, particularly with enterprises who are coming to BigQuery from older systems, is, is that you, know, you may have a query that has many, many stages, or you know, you're used to running it on your Teradata machine, and it runs for two days, and then it shows up. 
Um, I feel like this is one of those situations in which you really do have to kind of challenge your assumption, but not, not necessarily your assumptions about the data model. The model may be fine, right? There may be tweaks you can make, right? Um, but you kind of have to think about the workflow a little bit, right? So sometimes when we run these queries where we say, I'm going to submit it, I'll come back on Wednesday and we'll see what happened. Some of that's because you're actually operating in a resource constrained environment, right? You may have gotten used to it, but it is kind of resource constrained. I'm only getting a little bit of batch work and I can submit it in these time periods. And I think the challenge that, that, that I, the challenge I ask people to, 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 to push on that workload is, well, what if you broke it down, right? Are there materializations that can preserve work? Remember, at the, top of the, at the top of the talk, we talked about the fact that the cost of storage has plummeted such that duplicate data doesn't really cost that much, particularly if it doesn't live for very long, right? So if you have intermediate materializations, you can not only sort of preserve your work and maybe speed up the way you compute things over time, but you could also think, like, hey, maybe there's a broad intermediate form either a denormalized one or a set of normalized relationships that, uh, that are actually really useful for a broad set of people, right? If I have a number of analysts who are looking at sort of the same kind of things, maybe I can break my work down into sort of a large materialization that many analysts can then go do their leading edge computations on. And so one of the things I also see is this notion of like, oh, well, I, I'm coming from the, the big data space, right? Like I suffered, I suffered through MapReduce, we got to Hive, it, well, it's okay. It, it's okay. Um, but one of the things that really worked for me in Hive was uh, we partitioned our data. We had multiple levels of list partitioning. It was okay, right? We were able to go a little bit faster. Um, well, one of the things that, that I think is worth pointing out is not only does BigQuery offer the ability to do date partitioned tables, which is pretty common in data warehouses, um, but we have this notion of table sharding, which allows you to effectively have prefixes that are common amongst ta tables of common schema, and then wildcard searchable suffixes. So you can use that to emulate something like partitioning while providing yourself a, a lot of flexibility from a, a sort of partition management standpoint. So I think that's a thing that people can kind of look at if they're used to coming from something where list partitioning was, was really key to getting like a little bit more performance out, or just even organizing large amounts of data. Um, a good example of this actually is a lot of the things we've done with like the, the ground station observation data in the weather public data sets. Like this is a great example of like, oh, this is, we had a ton of data from 1929 to today. Gosh, we really ought to figure out a way to, to deal with that in a, in a somewhat partitioned fashion. Um, so, Daniel, do you want to talk about the nesting yeah. stuff? Because I think it, it's interesting to watch someone from the outside think about our, our nested structure. Totally. And I'll, I'll be honest, this, this challenges me. I am like a deeply relational like thinker. I want, I want things to be like up and down, side to side, and just... Tables are cool. Yeah, tables are good. Tables are good. Uh, tables are good. Um, so, you know, so let's, let's use a really simple example, like a I can print it on the screen simple example um, about, you know, I've got sessions or orders through some, some data that is conceptually nested. In the real world, there is a nesting pattern going on here, right? Um, and so normally, uh, no pun intended, normally the question that you would ask yourself is, well, should I normalize this data, which will be more efficient on the space front? Um, and the answer, as that graph from before showed us, is don't bother. That's not a good reason. There may be good reasons to do it, but space efficiency is not a reason to do it when you have an infinitely scalable cloud. Um, OK, so should I denormalize it so I don't have to worry about joins? OK. Uh, normally, the answer would be, well, maybe. You know, that, that might be more performant for certain types of queries, but maybe not for others. And you know. In BigQuery, at least, there is another option. There's a third option, which we never had before. So here is my really simple example. Uh, I have three orders, which happened in January. Um, they have, uh, this was very hard to come up with because I had to figure out uh, fruits and vegetables that started with E, um, but I did it. Uh, and uh, so we've got three orders. They each contain some number of items. Each of those items has a unit price. Super, super simple, right? So. One thing that we could do with this data is we could turn it into a snowflake, right? We could have our orders table, our orders items table, uh, order items table, and our items table, right? Great, normalized, yay! I feel so at peace because it's like I pre uh, I'm pretty sure I did that in my first database yeah, class in college, right? Like it's, I still I still harken back to those <laughs> days. Um, 
I realized that I like organized my CDs. Do you guys, some people may not know what CDs are. They're the <laughs> physical discs uh, that we, never mind. Um, uh, <laughs> but I liked to do it in order uh, when I was a kid. Um, anyway, uh, so, so you know, we could do this, and this would be totally fine. Another thing that we could do uh, is we could denormalize. We could stick it all on one table. Um, you know, we've got some repeated data here. We now know the uh, unit price of the banana twice. Unnecessary, space inefficient, but hey, no joins, right? Great. In BigQuery, there is a third option, which looks like this, which no one scream from horror. This is really weird looking and not OK for us who like tables. But we can just leave the table nested inside a column. Daniel, we heard you liked tables, so we put tables inside <laughs> your tables. <laughs> is it turtles all the way? Never mind. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I'll give everybody a second to, to compose themselves after looking at this. All right, so what we have here is a table in BigQuery, uh, which still has an order ID. It still has all the information, the top level information about an order, right? Order ID, order date, order total. And then inside the order items column, which is a column, we have fundamentally another table in each row. They all have the same schema, right? And I'm not going to go into the structs of arrays of structs of arrays of structs, but uh, that, that's a thing we could talk about we, in Q&A. That, that's <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is totally kosher, legit in BigQuery. You can do this. Now, why would you want to do this, right? Other than to drive your databases 101 <laughs> teacher crazy. Um, well, uh, actually, let me go back. The the reason is actually because. If I want to query something just about orders, remember that BigQuery is columnar. So that crazy thing on the right, don't need to worry about it. Stays in memory. I never touch it, right? I can get a count of orders really simply. Select count of all from orders. It's going to give me the answer, right? That's great. Now, when I do want some information about the items in the orders, I can unnest that structure go in and get the information, and then, and only then, unpack it and, and look at it, right? In the other examples, I have to choose one or the other up front. I, I have to either say, I'm going to normalize, because that makes it really easy to query stuff about orders, but kind of a pain to query stuff about the things in the orders, because now I have to do two joins. Remember, again, this is an incredibly simple data set. So if you're dealing with real data, this would actually be a pain, not just kind of a fun exercise. In the denormalized one, sure, I can get stuff about the items in the orders really easily, but just to find out how many orders I had, I have to do select count of distinct order ID. right? And so now I'm scanning a bunch of stuff repeatedly that I don't need. In this, I put off the choice about how I want to structure the data until query time, which is great, because I can choose the structure that makes sense for the type of query that I want to run. Right? This is a big deal when you're dealing with billions of rows of data. So the one problem, remember we said, well, in our, in our you know, list of things we want out of our, our data language, uh, is that writing the SQL for this is going to look a little funny. We're going to have to use this idea of left join unnest, which is weird and a little weird, right? So but it, with a data platform form with a third wave data tool, we're not writing the SQL, right? So I grabbed some LookML, which is our markup language, that deals with this. It says, yeah, there's this table at the top called order uh, orders, and it has this join called order items, uh, and here are the dimensions inside the views, uh, inside orders and order items. I can compose things like item total by multiplying you know, quantity and item price. I can specify multiple time frames. And you know, this probably looks a little bit weird to people who haven't seen LookML before. But the fun part is I can learn this real quickly, because I already speak SQL, and this is fundamentally just SQL. And then I can expose this to my business users. And so all of a sudden, they can then explore this data set freely and leave it to the tool, to the data platform, to write the appropriate SQL. They don't worry about how orders and order items are related. Whether I did the normalization, the denormalization, the nested structure, tool worries about that. 
So that stuff only gets written once, and now all of a sudden they can say, well, I want to know, you know orders by dates. I want to know how many bananas were bought on the 26th. They can just freely move around in this environment and ask questions. We send that those queries that the platform writes off to BigQuery, and assuming that there are more than you know, seven rows of data, BigQuery then uh, can very powerfully churn through that data and return any answer. Well, and you preserve, importantly, like you preserve the relational model of the world throughout. That's right. right. And so the relational model now spans all the way from the bottom, from the way that the data is actually structured in memory, all the way to the top, to the way that business people are accessing the data, right? And so this is, we have this sort of unified model that, that is both how the, how the information is organized at the most basic level and how people are are um, accessing so it. So at least logically, we're actually accomplishing a lot of what Cod, Cod set out to do. would be so happy. Um, uh, he'd probably be freaked out. I think cell phone would freak him out. Um, so um, you know, I'm going to hand it over to Dan to wrap up. Okay. If you want to, if we're downstairs, Looker is downstairs at E14. So as you're drinking a beer, uh, if you want to put our engineers to the test and make them actually explain LookML uh, to you, uh, that's on bigger data sets than this, come on down <laughs> to E14 and you can make them do that. Uh, and I'll enjoy watching them have to do it. So. OK, so I'm going to try and wrap up really quickly so that we maybe have even one or two minutes for questions, because I know there's also a happy hour that's happening, and I'm sure people are quite thirsty. Um, I think for me, the, the core of this is really you know, the relational model matters. You know, normalization, to some extent, matters. It's at the foundation of systems like BigQuery. You don't get you know, relational query processors, SQL-driven query processors, without that model. Right? And the logical continuity of it, I think, is really important all the way from how we build our distributed processing engine to the way you can model schema using not only the, the tools you have learned, but also things like nested and repeated fields. And it passes through through tools like Looker into the reporting space as well. But I think, again, it's important as we think about trying tools like BigQuery, trying tools like Looker, you know, we, we can't blindly accept the rules of the 70s, right? We have to know that they're important and know that they have given birth to the point we're at now. But anytime we're modeling data, we should just continue to ask ourselves, did this actually increase independence, data independence, independence for my users and their ability to analyze data? Is it helping users fundamentally do more or find insights? Um, is it reducing inconsistency? Is it making it easier for me to actually figure out what happened? Um, is it making those outliers come closer to, to the force so I can actually know what's going on? And then finally, if, if we're making a modeling choice because we believe performance is the reason, is it really meaningfully enabling performance or is it, is it really kind of premature? Like, well, you know, it goes a half a second faster and that's really important. Um, is it really important or is it better to help the user? So again, all of the things we learned from, from our friend the fish and from Mr. Cod are important. Um, we just need to make sure that we're aware that the systems we work with now allow us to potentially do quite a lot more. And with that, we've got only a couple of minutes left, but on behalf of myself and Daniel, I'd really like to thank you guys for sticking around even as happy hour started. We really appreciate it. Who knew data modeling could be so fun and fishy?